All right, so boom, 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 boom. I gotta follow the format here. This is a speaker meeting. Our speaker will share his experience, strength, and hope for approximately 45 minutes. We ask out of respect for our speaker to please remain seated until he has finished. It is my pleasure, it is a true pleasure to introduce Polly. Hi everybody, my name is Paul, I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I showed up in this jacket and it's friggin' hot, so it's coming off. <laughs> uh, my sobriety date is September 1st, 2016. Uh, my home group is uh, doing Humboldt Men's Stag Thursday night. Uh, that's your shout out. I have a sponsor. Most of the time he knows I have a sponsor. Uh, I'm a little bit combative at times. Um, and I sponsor guys. Um, and that's what I was taught when I got here this time. Um, I really love Alcoholics Anonymous, and I never thought you I would stand up here and say that. Um, I've come here for a long time. I've come in and out of these rooms for a long time. And so uh, there were a few newcomers tonight, and I see a lot of new faces. And uh, I'm going to talk. I'm going to have a talk that I'm going to direct towards those guys. Because when I got here, every time I came here, I came here lost and not knowing what to do. And I came here smarter than everybody else and more defiant than most. And uh, I fought this tooth and nails for a, lo for a long time, for decades, uh, before I was beaten into submission. And... Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I had a game plan about what I want to talk about when I got here. I don't know in what order it's all going to come out. I'll try to be as coherent as I can. Um, I am a last-minute replacement. Um, I'm just throwing it. I have a few disclaimers. That's the first one. Um, the second disclaimer I'll tell you right now is that some of the stuff that's going to come out of my mouth tonight, I never thought I would be able to say. Um, and that's talking with some sincerity, um, some honesty, um, and, and, and talking about things I never knew about, like uh, you know, serenity, peace of mind, um, a full life, a happy life. I never knew what those things were before I came here this time. And I, I always want to say this time, and I'll get that in my story. But um, you know, I, I, uh, I have to start at the beginning. You know, um, hold on a second. I better do my timer or I won't get sober quick enough. <laughs> okay, um, you know, I grew up, I grew up, I, I, I had a I had pretty, pretty good family life, even though for a long time I didn't think I did. Um, I had good parents. I had a really good father, and, I, and I, I gave him a lot of shit for a lot of years, and I had a lot of resentments for a lot of years, and the truth of the matter is, I know today that my father did more than the best he could. My father did a damn good job raising four kids on his own after my mother left. So I was the kid, I was the only kid on the block whose parents were divorced. I was the only kid in Massachusetts probably that had a stay at home, that he didn't stay at home. My, my father was my primary parent. My mother left, and this is the 70s, and uh, my dad went to work every day, came home, fed us, did our laundry after we went to bed. And I, I always took that for granted. You know, I, I did for years until I finally had kids of my own and I realized what that meant. Um, I was not a great parent for a long time. Uh, I had a lot of health problems growing up. I, was, uh, I, had, a, I had a very uh, visible condition that caused me a lot of uh, teasing at school. Uh, kids are cruel. And I was, uh, I was the, the brunt of a lot of jokes and a lot of uh, I was ostracized a lot. I was, I, I knew right away going into school that I was different from everybody else. Um, I was a case study at, Bo at uh, Boston Children's Hospital for the condition that I had. Um, so needless to say, my childhood from that point of view kind of sucked. Um, my parents pitied me a lot. My grandparents pitied me a lot. And I learned how to pity myself. 
uh, in which I carried through all my life. A good part of my adult life, I was consumed with self-pity. Uh, but I was different from everybody else, and I lived different than everybody else. I was that kid that didn't know what to do with myself. If there was a party, I was, I was the wallflower. I had a few friends, a few close friends from my neighborhood that stuck by me. Otherwise, I didn't have a lot of friends at school because I was different. And um, uh, I, I, I just held on to that. I held on to that into my teenage years. And I finally found alcohol. And when I found alcohol, it's like a switch went off, right? I, I, alcohol right away made me feel good. It made me, I wasn't self-conscious anymore. I wasn't different. I could talk to people, I could talk to girls. Um, I could do a lot of things that I could not do before alcohol. And um, you know, my, my first, I know I had other experiences with alcohol, but the one that comes to mind and John likes this story. Um, you know, my, my grandfather, my grandparents got ill. My grandmother got ill when I was about 15 or 16, and, and they lived close to us, so we would take shifts as kids uh, going up there and staying with my grandfather and grandma that helped take care of my grandmother. She had Alzheimer's, and she would wander out in the middle of the night if we didn't keep an eye on her. So I started going up there at 15 or 16, and Saturday night was my night. So... I started going up there on Saturdays to spend the night, and I noticed my, um, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I'm, I'm Irish Catholic. I have a very Catholic upbringing. I have an uncle who was a priest. We said mass in my house. Um, my grandparents were religious, very religious. I was gonna say fanatics, but they weren't fanatics. Um, my grandfather was a tough guy. He was a very good grandfather. He was a hard drinking, scrappy Irishman and I grew up wanting to be him. Um, I was not a tough guy. I was a weak little kid with a lot of health problems, and I wanted to be just like my grandfather. Um, so one night, my grandfather's getting ready to, bed, to go to bed, and I had noticed he kept disappearing into the garage all night. You know, he'd go out in the garage, and he'd come back, and he said goodnight. I don't know what time it was, but he said, and they called me Michael. Um, I grew up as a Michael because I'm a junior. And he said, I'm going to bed, Michael. And I watched him bounce off the walls going down the hallway. And I remember saying to myself, what's in that garage, right? And I, so I searched out. I had to, he, he had a good hiding spot. And, and um, in my family, beer and whiskey were about the only things that got drunk. And uh, I found my grandfather's bottle of Canadian Club. And it was hidden behind the dryer. And uh, I found that bottle and I proceeded to pour myself a highball glass, and we had real highball glasses. They were probably about a 10 or 12 ounce glass, and I, I just about filled that thing with whiskey. And I stood by the sink, and I took a good chug, and I held it down, and then I took another chug, and I just tipped that thing back. And then I rinsed the glass out so I wouldn't get caught. And, and then I walked in, and I sat down on the couch, and all of a sudden, that whiskey just went right through me. And it, it just went all the way down to my toes, and it warmed me inside, and everything faded into goodness, right? And uh, that was my first experience with alcohol, and I loved it. I loved it. I, I drank right away for the effect. I didn't drink for any other reason. I wanted to know what this stuff did. I, w I wanted to know why my grandfather was staggering down the hallway, and I found out. And so on every Saturday for the next year probably, I went to that house, and as soon as my grandfather went to bed, I would fill that highball glass with whiskey, and I would chug it down, and then I wouldn't walk, I would run to the couch, and I would dive for that couch, and I would lay there and I would wait, and I would wait for that feeling that whiskey would go through me, right? And it was like a hug, right? You were waiting for that. It was like a hug, right? It made everything better, it made everything feel good, and I would just veg there on the couch till I passed out. And that's what I did every, every Saturday night for the longest time. And that was my introduction to alcohol. And, and I drank that way. No matter what I did, I didn't drink to be social. You know, I drank to get drunk. I drank for that feeling of uh, confidence that alcohol gave me, um, that it made all my troubles go away. 
and it just made me feel like somebody. And for the and into my young adulthood, I could not differentiate. Uh, I thought I thought that drunk was my natural state. Like I was not right unless I had a few shots in me, right? Because then I was my normalist of normal, right? I do, wasn't afraid of everything. Uh, I was the opposite, actually. It got me in a lot of trouble. I was fearless when I got alcohol in me. I would do anything. I would take any dare. I would take any challenge. I would do any stupid thing you asked me to do. As long as I was liquored up, I would do it. And um, alcohol worked for me for a long time. It really did. I, I, uh, I learned, I, I'm, a, I'm a tradesman. I learned at an early age how to drink every day. You know, I came back to, we would, the guy I work with, my journeyman, you know, I'm an electrician, Isaac's an electrician, so I'm gonna get a nod here and there as the night goes on. And we would start drinking as soon as the job ended. The first liquor store we'd pass, me and my journeyman, we'd have to, de we'd have to decide how long the ride was. And the, I, I guess the going rate was, if it was longer than a half hour, it was a 12 pack ride. If it was less than a half hour, it was a six pack ride. And we just needed that to get us to the shop because at the shop, there was a fridge full of beer, right? So we would prime ourselves on the ride and then every day after work, it, it revolved around drinking at the shop, shooting dots, getting in trouble. Um, and that was, that, was my, that, was my, that was my life, right? I went to work, I went to work every day, I drank every day. And I managed, you know, I, I, I had a few embarrassing moments here and there. I had a few blackouts here and there. Um, I'd have to make a few apologies here and there. But for the most part into my mid twenties, you know, alcohol was my solution, right? Uh, I didn't have any real bad effects from alcohol. And the only thing I got out of it to, in my eyes was good. Um, in my mid twenties, I started having problems with alcohol. Um, I was drinking, I was blacking out a lot. I was uh, embarrassing my family a lot. Uh, I was calling in sick to work a lot. And I can remember calling my boss on a, on a Monday, calling in sick and coming in, coming in Tuesday and apologizing and saying, you know, his name was Bill. And I'm like, I'm sorry, Bill. You know, I, you know, I, I hate calling in like that, but you know, I just had too much to drink. <laughs> and. He, and he knew he was a drunk, right? And he said, you know what? You know what, Michael, because I was still going by Michael. Mike, you're a good electrician. You're a hard worker. I just know that you're good for one Monday a month, right? <laughs> so now I had permission, right? So now I had permission to call in at least once a month, right? And I, it was okay, right? Um, I started having problems at home. My, my parents started pleading with me not to drink so much. I can remember the cops bringing me home one night because I had a car accident back in those days. You know, the cops took me home. My car got towed. The cops drove me off to the front door, and my father opened the door to, to the cops, you know, and he said, what happened? And I said, I had a car accident, and the cops drove me home. And, you know, my dad was like, you know, when, when's this going to stop? You know, you're drinking a lot. And I had, a, I had an uncle who was an alcoholic, and I hated that guy. I hated him. You know, he used to beat up my grandparents. Um, I had to come to their rescue a couple of times at a young age, and I hated my Uncle Jack. And my father said, you are just like my brother. And, I, I, you know, for the first time in my life, I wanted, to, I wanted to sock my father. And I told him that. And, you know, I said, Dad, I, I've never wanted to hit you before, but I want to hit you now. And I walked, and I walked away. And, uh, you know, that's where, that's where alcohol had brought me. It had brought me to a place where the one person in my life that I hated in my family, I was being compared to now. And uh, my mother came to Alcoholics Anonymous on my behalf. Um, she was not an alcoholic. She came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, sorry, I lost, my, I lost my time. Okay, I'm still good, I'm still good. I'm not starting over. Uh, my mother came to Alcoholics Anonymous because she knew her son had a drinking problem and she knew, she knew me and she couldn't just get me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. She just couldn't say, hey, would you go to Alcoholics Anonymous? So she went on her own for a half dozen times. And she said, you know, I've been going to these AA meetings and maybe you'd like to come to one with me and the people are really nice. 
you know, people are really nice and you'll like them. And so I agreed reluctantly to come to a meeting with my mother. And uh, I can remember that first day at, of, at AA sitting there, not wanting to be there. And, you know, AA people being who they are, they knew we were new. And they come over and started talking to us. And I stood up after the meeting and a couple of people shook my hand and, and they said, are you an alcoholic? And I said, yeah, I think so. And, and then they looked at my mother and they said, are you an alcoholic? And my mother just started bawling. No, but my son is. <laughs> and, and, and they're hugging her and they're hugging her. And I can remember going, Jesus Christ, Ma, how can you do this to me? Right? How can you do that? You're embarrassing me, woman. Right? And I was so mad at my mother. And we left that night, and I swore I'd never go back. And uh, that was my first introduction to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and within a short matter of time, I, just, I, I agreed to go to Alcoholics Anonymous because my life was getting out of control. But um, I would go, and I would, I would stay dry for a while. Um, I would swear off. Uh, I would mean it. You know, I, kinda. You know, I was a kid. Um, I, w I was doing it to keep my parents happy, keep my girlfriend happy. I, I had a long-term girlfriend at the time, and um, they all wanted me to stop drinking, so I gave it a shot. Um, my heart really wasn't in it, and it, it, it didn't take it all. But um, that was my first experience. Um, I came to California on a geographic. You know, my girlfriend, my long-term girlfriend had had enough. Um, she told me she, she, she couldn't stay with me anymore because of my drinking. Um, my father had moved to San Diego, so I thought it would be a good idea to go to San Diego for a while and get away. Um, I moved to San Diego. I, I, I started drinking pretty heavy. Um, my dad took me to detox. For the first time in my life, I went to detox. My dad dropped me off, and when he did, he said, I, I hate to say this to you, but you can't come back. You know, so... Uh, I, I slept on the mats in Escondido, California um, for about a week. And for the first time in my life, I, I actually begged to get into a treatment place, right? I, I put on a show, right? I put on a, a dog and pony show. I, I threw a few tears into the mix uh, because I had no place to go. And, and uh, so I, I got myself into this treatment place and it was the only time I've been in a live-in facility. But I, I did about six months at this place. I stayed sober for a while. I stayed sober for almost two years. I met my, the woman that is today my wife while I was sober. Um, uh, we got married a um, short time after we met, you know, like eight months. And by the time we got married, I was drinking again. And, and you know, that's just history. That's our history. And uh, she's watching. I, um, um, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and for the next shit I was 30 so for the next 20 years I got some decent sobriety time or dry time whatever you want to call it I would come to Alcoholics Anonymous and and, and again I'm talking to the new guys here because uh, there's a lot of ways to do AA um, unfortunately there's a lot of ways to do AA you can do it my way which is the stupid beat your, beat your head against the wall way or you can do it the way some of my friends have done it and they, they got sober once and they stayed sober um, I, I tend to be hard-headed, stubborn, stupid, and uh, I kept thinking it would get better every time I went out. And uh, the same thing happened every time. I, uh, I've come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I wanted to, because I was desperate. Right? I come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I was losing a job, or my wife. Now my first, my parents were begging me to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now my wife was begging me to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. Right? And I had two, I had two uh, stepdaughters um, that I was raising. That were, that were younger, and they were seeing me drinking. You know, I was gone all the time. I was either working or drinking. I was never home. Um, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous after a couple of years of drinking, and I got sober again. Uh, I stayed sober, I think, this time for, t for two years. I went back out for a while, came back, you know, and that, that cycle just repeated itself. And, you know, we have a joke in my group that there, you, you hear guys – when well, we're picking up chips, right? You get your 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, nine months, and everyone likes to say, you know, nobody gets nine months. And my response is to that, I've had nine months five times, right? <laughs> I have had nine months. Five, I have taken nine, five nine-month tokens, um, and, then, and I'm not bragging. Um, I had, uh, I had, I've had multiple 
long, long bouts of dryness. Um, the last one was 10 years. I went 10 years between drinks. Uh, the first five involved in Alcoholics Anonymous somewhat. Uh, the last five white knuckle in it. And I will tell you that um, my family had two choices, um, deal with a wet drunk or deal with a dry drunk. And they, it wasn't much better, but they, did, they got the dry drunk for about 10 years. And I was still bitter, angry, pissed off. I was a tyrant in my own house. I was a control freak. Um, I was held to live with. I don't know how my family put up with me, um, but they did, you know, they did. And every time I went back out, it got worse. And every time I went back out, my bottom got lower. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk now just about this last time. So this last time, my last drunk, um, I, I, I don't really like telling the story, but I'm gonna tell it. Um, so I, I, I'm a lousy parent. I, I figure I was not a great parent. I don't wanna say lousy. I, was a, I provided for my family, but that's about all I did. Um, but I thought I was a great grandparent, right? I was an awesome grandparent. Right? And I took great, great care of my grandchildren. I had three grandkids at the time, two granddaughters and a grandson. Um, I thought it would be really cool to take my grandson to Disneyland on his 10th birthday. Uh, so just me and my grandson, Disneyland, uh, 2016. So I, I'm at Disneyland, I'm gonna make it quick. So we go to Disneyland, great, great men's weekend. Um, and this is where, you know, I, I never really got the, the whole obsession analogy. And there's, there's an obsession of the mind and an analogy of the body, you know, they're coupled together and one feeds into the other. And I never really got that until this weekend, right? So yeah, I go to Disneyland with my grandson and I think it's a good idea because it's just the two of us and he's only 10, he won't know that I can have a couple of drinks with dinner, right? Just to, it will enhance the fun, you know? Um, I'm not gonna get drunk, I'm just gonna have a couple. So I pull the waitress aside and I say, every time I order a Coke, I really don't mean a Coke, I mean a double Bacardi and Coke. <laughs> so I tell her, I pull the waitress aside, I tell her that and so she starts feeding me double Bacardi Cokes and me and my grands, you know, Goofy, we're at, we're at Goofy's, uh, it's his birthday, Goofy comes to our table, we're having this big time, right? It's a great time. Uh, the first night was pretty, pretty good. Um, second day wasn't so good. I went to the liquor store and got a couple of fifths. Um, uh, fast forward to the second night. Um, I never made it into Disneyland the second day, I passed out. My grandson quietly sat and played his video game for, for, hour, for hours. He tried to wake me up a few times. It took him a long time to call his mother. He was, he was afraid. He called my daughter, and uh, my daughter knew exactly what was going on. She called the cops. So I'm one of the only people I know that are in a Disneyland resort with his grandson, and I had the cops come to my door and take my grandson away for his own protection. Um, that was... The low point of my life, I couldn't get any worse. Um, my grandson was taken away, so I decided that I'm going to get drunk for a week, and I'm going to—I'm never going home. I'm just going to—I'm just going to end it. And uh, that I set off to do that. I, I set off to do that. Um, I wasn't successful. Um, the the hotel I was staying in—I don't stay in dumps. I was staying in a really nice hotel. And, and after about 10 days in a nice hotel of yelling and screaming in, the, in your room and, and leaving in the middle of the night to get more booze and coming back, they, they had had enough. And the, the cops came in and, and, and they, they took me to get another hospital trip. Um, I came back here with my tail between my legs and, I, and I, I swore this would never happen again. And I meant it with all my heart. I will not get drunk again. And, uh, You know, there's a, there's a part, couple of parts in the big book that I really identify with. And, and when I first came, when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, I want to say the first time I spoke, and every time I speak, I get, I'm, I'm pretty nervous right now. I'm not going to lie. I didn't think I was till I get up here. Every time I speak, I get a little less nervous. But the first time I spoke, I was about a year sober. And the only thing I could relate to you people was the fact that, uh, 
you know, the things they talk about in the big book. Uh, no, no words can describe the loneliness and despair I found in that pit, bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand spread around me in all directions. You know, I had met my match. Alcohol was my master. You know, I was defeated. Those are the things that I talked about when I got the Alcoholics Anonymous, and I had been sober about a year. Today I want to go, you know, the next step, which is what's happened in my life since that first year, right? Um, my life today resembles my old life very little. I'm still the same guy. I still have the same wife. I still have the same kids. I have an additional grandson now. Um, my Alcoholics Anonymous has granted me a new way of life. Um, I did not stay sober after that Disneyland trip. Um, I did outpatient. I, I stayed sober about 90 days. I swore I would never drink again. I pulled that grandson aside and I told him, I can't believe this happened. It's never going to happen again. I will never drink again. I will never drink again. 90 days later, I was drunk. Right? And that last few months, all I can tell you is there was, there was not a sane thought in my head. I went to work. My job was trying to get rid of me. I knew they were compiling that paper trail they could use to finally fire me and be rid of me, right? I knew that was going on, but I still could not stop calling in to work for two or three days at a time every time I drank. Um, I was driving. I was taking pills the doctor were giving me to try to stop drinking. I, I got hooked on those along with the, the alcohol. Um, I was, it was just chaos. It was insanity. Um, the end result of that was I drove off a cliff. I went down 75 feet into a ravine on, on I-17 and I was pretty much dead when I got to the hospital. Um, a lot of guys have heard this story, so I'm not going to dwell on it. I, I was three weeks in a coma. They wanted to give me last rites. My wife would not let them because she knew I was, I was brought up Catholic, and if she thought that if I heard them giving me my last rites, I would die. And she's probably right. Um, I, somehow I was saved. Somehow I, I, I walked away from that hospital and did about a year of physical therapy to learn how to use my arm again. Um, and finally, finally I was beat, right? I, I remember one night at my kitchen, shortly after I got home, and I asked my wife, I asked my wife, will you drop me off at step one, back when we had the old step one. Will you drop me off at step one and I'll get a ride home? And she's like, why? know why because I want to go to a meeting and she said why Polly you know Alcoholics Anonymous she was not mean she was not vindictive she was as caring as she could have been she, you don't have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous anymore Polly it does not work for you you will figure something else out and I remember at that moment standing in my kitchen I was never so scared of my life because I knew from experience the people that I had seen stay sober and put their lives together, that Alcoholics Anonymous was the only place that, that there was hope for me. And the only difference between when I came in that time and when I came in all the other times is I was finally willing. I was finally willing. You know, Isaac, Isaac my friend Isaac likes to talk about, you know, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. And those are three commodities I did not have. I, was not a, I did not have the ability to be honest. I was as close-minded as they come. You people were freaks, right? You were religious fanatics. I didn't want, did you ever thought I would come up here with a big book in my hand? Because that's, that's, you know, that's preacher shit. I would never do that. I don't want any part of that, right? I was so close-minded and I was unwilling because I had been here many times. I was unwilling to do the work. I picked and choose which steps I would do. And the other ones I would cast aside, I really don't need those because I'm smarter than you guys, right? I'm too smart. Um, I finally was ready to do it, and I did it. I jumped in with both feet. I, I told my sponsor, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me. I, I worked the steps as quick as I could. I took commitments. I took suggestions. And slowly but surely, my life got better. And then I used to, I used to tell my friend, used to be my sponsor, I, I would tell him, I, you know, I was driving to work today and this, this weird fucking thing happened. Sorry, I didn't mean to cuss. This weird thing happened. He's like, what's that? I felt good. Like, I, I was driving to work and all of a sudden I, I wasn't worried about anything. 
I was happy to be going to work. I, my life at home was good. And I go, dude, it lasted like 15 minutes. It lasted like 15 minutes. I used to drink for that feeling, and I would drink past it in five. Right? And I had this 15 minutes of good feeling good. You know, and, and I, I would get that 15 minutes a day always in the same spot. The bottom of Robert Road, between Robert Road, and I work at Ruger, between Robert Road and Ruger, I would get this 15 minutes a piece, right? And then, and then it started going into my work day, you know, and then it would last an hour, right? And I'd have this hour a piece. I'm like, what, what the fuck? <coughs> Sorry again. What the hell's going on, <laughs> right? I used to pay for this feeling, right? I, I paid good money to feel this way, and I was getting it for nothing. And slowly but surely, it, it just get bigger and bigger. And, I, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm not lying, I don't know when the last time I stayed up late at night worrying about anything. I used to have sleepless nights over work. I used to have sleepless nights over bills. I, you know, I still have a job and I still have bills. I just don't lose sleep over any of that shit anymore, right? I learned Alcoholics Anonymous gave, you know, I was given grace I didn't deserve by living through that accident, right? I, was, I, I don't deserve anybody's grace. I don't deserve a relationship with a higher power. I don't deserve to be spiritual, right? But something was given to me. Today, um, I, things, I was telling you what, what I, I like to read in the big book when I got here. And today, it's a totally different thing. And I'm only reading it because I don't want to screw it up. Um, you know, in the be beginning of the 12 and 12, it says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature which, if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole, right? I never got that. Especially the part is, if practiced as a way of life, right? And I don't mean, I, I don't get up in the morning, I, I, I definitely don't do this thing perfectly. I don't get up in the middle of the morning and kumbaya and any of that stuff. You know, I get up, I have my little, my little quiet time with my cup of coffee in the morning, I go about my day, but what I've really had is, is a, is a uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Isaac? I have had a spiritual experience, but that's not it. I have, I have daily reprieve. Anybody else? Anybody else? I've had a psychic change. I have had a psychic change, right? And I knew that coming in here, but I'm, I'm, I'm old and I've done a lot of drinking. Right? So I can't think of these things all the time. You know, I've had, I've had a psychic change. Things, I do things today that it never would have dawned on me to do today. Like, I don't know, be nice to my wife. Right? I'm not always nice to her. She'll, she'll be the first one to tell you. But I actually think about how she feels today. Right? I, I actually think, um, I get a little bit of time. I, my grandson, my grandson, by the way, is here tonight. I'm not going to point at him. Um, the kid that was 10 is now 15. He's four inches taller than me. Um, I'm, not, I'm not tall to begin with, but he's tall. And um, he's way better looking. Thank you, Isaac. Way better looking than me. Um, but I get a gift today that my grandsons, both him and his brother, his brother is four years old, and my daughter live with me today. This is the the lady that had to call the police to have her son picked up out of Disneyland that I never thought I could face again. They live with me under my roof. Um, it, you know, she pays her way. We have a great relationship. I wouldn't change a thing about it, right? But that's a gift today. That, that's the gift that Alcoholics Anonymous, that's just one, one gift that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. You know, I came here, I went through the steps, I did what they told me, I took commitments, um, they don't feel like work. Sometimes they do, honestly. I guess I'll have to call myself a liar. Sometimes they do. Sometimes I don't feel like going to a meeting, right? Sometimes I'd rather sit at home on the couch and watch Ancient Aliens <laughs> for the 17th time. The same episode, right? I say that for Isaac because Isaac is a geek with Ancient Aliens like me. Um, but I get up off my ass and I go, and I always feel better that I do. Because in, there was a time where I would say, you know what, I worked hard today. Screw that meeting. I'm going to just stay home and watch Ancient Aliens, have something to eat, and go to bed. Sorry. <laughs> you distracted me. 
lost my whole train of thought now, Tim. Ancient aliens. Ancient aliens. Ancient aliens. Um, I have a life today I never dreamed possible. And if you know me, shit like this don't come out of my mouth, especially my wife. I don't talk like this. I have the best family life I could have ever imagined. When I dreamed of what my life would be when I was a kid and the white picket fence and all that good stuff that we want, I never dreamed it could be this good, right? When I got here, my wife was a bitch, right? She always nagged at me. <laughs> Dan, Dan, Dan and Beth are like, oh, shit. <laughs> they, she know, they know my wife, right? My wife is a bitch. My kids just wanted shit from me. My grandkids were spoiled, you know, and I had resentments against them all. You know, I loved and hated them at the same time. All this shit. And today, they're not, right? My wife is not a bitch, right? When did she change? Right? When did she get a program and change? You know, when did my, my daughters stop being just, you know, takers, right? I don't know, because now they're awesome, right? The only person that changed is me, right? And when I changed, my perception changed. And all the people that I thought were, were, were driving me crazy, they were actually putting up with me. And I'm grateful that they did, because today I have a life Second to none. I wouldn't trade lives with anybody. I remember people saying that when I got here. I'm like, what the fuck? You know? I want anybody's life but mine. Right? I wouldn't trade lives with anybody today. Right? I have a job that I, I like. I, I, sometimes I love it. Sometimes I hate it. Right? But I get, to, get up and I go to work every day, and I'm pretty happy doing it. Right? I got friends. I, I can't tell you how many friends I have today. And the thing that I fought the hardest, and you guys aren't going to like this, Everyone told me I had to change my friends, right? You might have to change your friends, you know, because my friends were drinker buddies and stuff like that, and I fought that tooth and nail. I fought it. I can have both, right? I can have my non-drinking friends, and I can have my, my AA friends and, and all this stuff, and I, I would try this juggling act for years, and it just didn't work. And eventually, all my friends disappeared, all my normal friends. I had a best friend at 20-something years, right? He unfriended me on Facebook just before I got here, right? You know, my best friend, my brother. You know, we, we, we tell you, we're, we're better than brothers, right? That's my fault. You know, I had a resentment against him for the long time. How dare that son of a bitch unfriend me, that ungrateful bastard, right? <laughs> but it was all my doing, right? I have more friends today, and, and you're not going to want to hear it. They're all alcoholics. They're all alcoholics in recovery. And... You know, I don't miss the life I used to have, you know. Uh, that, that change took place in my life, and I haven't looked back. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what else, I don't, I don't know how I can cap that off. Um, I do have a couple more minutes, so I'll bore you. Um, can I, can I, Tim? I know I highlighted a couple things I wanted to read. Now you got me nervous. Tim, Tim got me screwed up. Oh, well, I can't find it because I'm nervous. But my life today resembles the old life but a little. Um, all I did was what the book said. I took these steps. I actually took them in order. I took direction from a sponsor. Uh, like I said earlier, I sponsor people today. I help other guys go through the steps the way somebody helped me. Um, I put my hand out. Um, I try to be helpful. I try to be a good person inside of Alcoholics Anonymous. And even harder, I try to be a good person outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was always the star of the show. Wherever I went, I was the star of the show, right? I was the star of the show at work. I was the lead. I, I had a crown, I got to tell you. I get this crown at home. And whenever I wanted shit happen into my house, I would put the crown on. And I'm the king of <laughs> my mother's biggest mistake before she died was she, when she brought me a crown, like a real crown. And she said, you're the king of your own castle now, son. And so every time I wanted something to happen in my house, I put that crown on. And I said, I'm the king of this castle, and you are my servants, and you will do my bidding. And I wore that crown around, and I was serious as shit, right? I was. And my kids knew, and my kids and my wife knew, and that, I might be joking about it a little bit, but they knew I was, I was serious, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm the king. I'm the tyrant. 
you'll do what I say or I'll make your life miserable. And, and today, today it's nothing like that. Today, I slip into that every once in a while, but I catch myself because you guys taught me how to, how to see that shit, right? Uh, you know, I have friends that if I'm acting out, they go, hey, dude, you know, you've been kind of, you've been kind of rough lately, you know, rough around the edges. And, I, and a lot of times I see it myself. I see it at work. I'll be barking at guys. I'll be making fun of guys. I'll be, I'll be shitting on my boss. And all of a sudden, I'll start, I'll start feeling like crap, right? And then I get to reel it in. I get to make amends. And I don't know who that guy is. I don't know who he is, right? But my life today absolutely does not resemble my old life, except I'm still the same guy, right? Um, I always thought I'd lose myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I did was I found myself in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I, I found a way of life that I just can't, I can't put into words how great it is. And I don't talk like this. <laughs> you know, that's all I can tell you is this shit comes from something else. Uh, it just comes from doing, uh, it's a doing thing, like Mike Tumaloni says, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a thinking thing, it's a doing thing. And I, I learned how to do this shit from watching people that came here before me and to listening to what they had to say. And, uh, you know, I hope I hope I help somebody tonight. Thanks. Let's thank our speaker one more time.